Thank you, my lord. Um, before the uh, adjournment, I was taking the court through the judgment of Deputy District Judge Hornby, and in particular, as you may recall, uh, I was signposting for the, the, the court a number of aspects of the um, judgment in relation to his conclusion as to credibility uh, that, that we say are relevant when the court comes to look at the judgment of the Zion Judge Greenspoon. And if I may just conclude that exercise. So if, if we um, look again at the judgment of his honour judge, forgive me, Deputy District Judge Hornby, and we were particularly at paragraph uh, 125, I believe, of that judgment, which you will... <coughs> I bet you had taken us to 131 by now. Thank you. Um, so um, if I can then just make a number of further submissions about the conclusions that the judge mm. reached, because they then, as I say, um, raise questions about his read in particular of the AD interview. Um, if one goes on from uh, paragraph 131, which is the paragraph I'd looked at before the break, um, you can see in paragraph 132 he reaches the conclusion Having taken into account the above, I am satisfied that there is nothing I have heard in the evidence during the course of this hearing, nor have I read through the extensive papers which paints a picture of F as other than a bright, <coughs> intelligent, sensible, and truthful person. And we say again that that last uh, provision in relation to the truthfulness of um, F is, is problematic, and that he reaches that conclusion before he looks at the defects in the AB um, interview is, is um, we say, indicative of uh, defects in his own reasoning. You can see a paragraph 134, his account that the evidence I have seen points to a consistent account uh, of what occurred to her. Now, pausing there, my lords and my lady were taken by um, Mr. Goodwin before the break this morning uh, to the original um, allegation which was made by F and that was that the um, child had been taken by these two males and the stepmother to a park. Uh, and of course, uh, in the evidence that Deputy District Judge heard, uh, in the evidence that he heard particularly from the social worker, um, a Miss D, her evidence was that that was quite a significant inconsistency. Well, um, have we, have we, do you want to, we, we looked at this in some detail, didn't we? Um, and the, it seems that the contemporaneous records of the first discussion at the school all show that the child didn't refer to being taken to the park. Well, and the first and the first reference to it came in the in the um, um, strategy meeting. Yes. And then it gets into uh, PD's statement. Can you add anything to that? the ingredients of that? Uh, only this, that it <coughs> is my understanding that the way in which it comes into the strategy meeting is that it is brought in by the police officer who was present when the child made the allegation. So it is a, an account which is given by an officer at the time. I'll turn my back because that is the information that we got just Mr. Kobel over at the Dimension Jersey. So, Mr. Povell, and I'll, I'll, I'll get a reference from my lord in a moment. Um, Mr. Povell reminded me over the luncheon adjournment that it was a Sergeant O'Neill who was at the original meeting with the um, child, and it was Sergeant O'Neill who reported that information to the strategy meeting. And, and I accept that there isn't, but I'll check with Mr. Povell in a moment, I accept that there isn't a written account of that. And it's, it's not only is there not a written account uh, that contains it, but the written accounts don't contain it, if you see what I mean. So the log and the... Yes, I, I understand, and the, yes, I understand yeah. my lawyer's point, but, but I suppose the difficulty... Um, it, it, there, there are two difficulties, if I may, that arise uh, from the, this evidence, um, and, and difficulties with which the Deputy District Judge didn't wrestle, as it were. One is that um, there is an account given by an officer who was present at the time, um, which is recorded in a, a meeting, uh, and so there is uh, evidence, primary evidence, from a witness who heard the child give that account. But secondly, um, it, it is no better or no um, uh, less, if you like, in terms of its probative value than what was written by the social worker, what is in the written account. Both are accounts given by individuals who were present at the time. Well, 
Just and a moment. Just a moment. I may be missing something here. So, so, so the people present at the meeting, calling the strategy meeting at I two. I'm sorry, I don't have the. It's the supplemental. <coughs> were, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, were uh, a social work manager, DS, Sergeant O'Neill, and the duty inspector. Is that right? Let me just clarify with Mr. Koval if the duty inspector is Sergeant O'Neill. So, um, my lord, if, you, if one is looking at I two, oh. at the top of I two, there is um, summary of information shared by agencies present, and then there is um, professionals involved in the discussion. That's the that's the strategy discussion. Yes. That's not the discussion at the school. Well, my, my understanding is that Sergeant O'Neill. If, if we just work backwards from this, because I'm, I'm just working on the information that I've been given from Mr. Mr. Povell, and just to track it backwards, if I may. Mm -hmm. At I2, um, those individuals who are referred to professionals involved in the discussion, Sergeant O'Neill, who is, is one of those three individuals, is the person who reports into the strategy meeting that F had dis, uh, alleged that she had been taken to the Park, and it is my understanding that Sergeant O'Neill was present at the discussion at the school on the 6th of May. Where, where do we get all of that from? I, I don't see it on I2 as such. What, what it does... See if I can track it back with Mr. Mr. Povell, because my understanding is that... Was it F82? I'm just going to just clarify. There, there are two um, points that Mr. Koval makes in relation to this, and, and if I can just take you through it. Looking at I2, mm. update of the social worker and police visit. The sentence begins, social worker and police attended the school and spoken with F. She has relayed the same information as before. Mm. In that, and then it goes on to give the substance of that, mm -hmm. and the substance of it refers, takes them both to a park, yes. and, and so on. So, Mr. Povell's understanding and the evidence that was before the judge, and this, as I understand it, is in the statement of Miss McKay, which we were taken to um, by Mr. Goodwin this morning in the C-section of the bundle, that when um, <coughs> the police and the social worker attended at the school, that the evidence or the information that the child gave was this information, which is recorded here in the strategy meeting. So there is the reference back to her giving the same evidence as she had given before, the same information, and that being in relation to the park. And it, it was that which led um, the social worker, Miss D, when she was giving her evidence to Deputy District Judge Hornby, to say that that was a significant departure when she then, at a later stage, referred to the um, allegations having taken place, or the, the incidents having taken place in a car outside of yes. her home. But is there evidence before this court that it, Sergeant O'Neill was present at that meeting at the school 
and directly himself heard FT say that? Um, I believe it may be in the statement of Miss McKay, but I would need to just check with Mr. Coble. Well, at C57... C57 is just what Mr. Coble has given me, but my lord is there already. C57 is a statement from CW, the operation will lead, I think. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 7 it identifies two other officers, LE and LR, and two social workers whose names are given. Well, is there a reference to O'Neill? Not in that. Not, there is a reference. Right. There's well, no well, reference to O'Neill there. Well, 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 why don't we let uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Ms. Hartrell, yes. if you can give us the reference to Sergeant O'Neill directly hearing from FT that she was taken to a park, then I would like to see that evidence. Yes, well, I, I understand that. Um, there is, of course, also, um, it is Sergeant O'Neill who was reporting to the meeting, but there is also the social worker present at that meeting as well, who was present at the earlier yes. meeting. But I understand my Lord's point. If there is something in the evidence, you would like to know where it is. And, and if there yes. is, Mr. Well, Coleman, well, I, will, yeah. I may have misunderstood, but I think we heard earlier that Sergeant O'Neill had reported to the strategy meeting on the 6th of May and that he had been present at the school when FT gave her account. So that, that, that's what I'm yes, interested in. Yes, my understanding is that the sequence of events was that FT attended at the school with her father and that the first account at the school was given by FT to a teacher, Miss McKay. And... There was then a further discussion at the school at which Miss McKay, a social worker and a police officer were present. That is my understanding of the evidence that was for the, yeah. before the deputy district judge and, and that the first and the second meeting were then summarised yeah. in the strategy discussion. Yeah. But I understand my Lord's question. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not in a position to answer it at the moment, but I'll right. check and see if there is a reference. Of course, yes, I know that your junior can help give us the references while you're on your feet. Thank you. Um, but, my lords, returning then to the, let me pause for a moment and see if, if I have that reference, and if I don't, I'll just carry on, if I may, with the Please submission. Well, I don't want to interrupt, but may I insist that this C5 contains another reference to who was present, um, in addition to which, if it would assist my lords... What? Does, does it answer my question of whether Sergeant O'Neill was present and whether he heard directly the child give this account? Um, my Lord, those don't, but what does is the police investigation log from that visit, which is not in the appeal, appeal bundle, right. which we do have, and it may well be that my right. Lord, the answer to your Lordship's question, forgive me, is in the bundle, because there's a document within the police log that says who was present at the school that day, and it's an F83 PDF 317, and it lists DC Emmett and DC Rogers, but no one else. No. F83. F83, PDF 317. Even though I would have just clarified my instructions. Yes. Um, it, it may be that I continue with my submissions, yes. if I may, and if, if Mr. Povel has a reference that he would like me to draw to your attention, yes. it, he will uh, pass it on to me, because Sorry. I don't want to go down a rabbit burrow on that issue, yeah. as it were. Of course. And the, the global submission that I'm making uh, relates to the exercise that the certainly. Deputy District Judge... Has certainly. Done. Certainly. And if at some point... Let, let's see how we get on. Um, if there's time this afternoon, and, and you need five minutes... <coughs> To consider this further, then of course you will have that. But, but I'm, I'm anxious that you should finish your submissions. Yes, yes. And, and of course, um, the other council should have their opportunity to make yes, submissions course, as well. Course. So, returning then to the, the points that I was um, making in relation to the judgment of the Deputy District Judge, 
um, I have been making the submission as to the consistent accounts and the truthfulness of her evidence. And the judge deals with that, as I said, at 134. And then he goes on to deal with the evidence of the parents. And he returns, if one then leapfrogs, as it were, in the judgment, he returns to the AB interview at paragraph 156. Now, this obviously is a matter which greatly troubles his honour, Judge Greenspan. But he returns to the AB interview to deal with what are the defects in the AB interview. And I'll pause there, if I may, and just remind the court of the submission that I made before the adjournment which went to the fact at the beginning of his analysis of the allegations, he says, I am aware that there are deficiencies in, in the AB interview. This is where he returns to those deficiencies. And, and in my submission, this is very problematic how he deals with this. Um, he sets out his own observations about the um, Detective Constable R, um, noting that that person was unfamiliar with the guidance. Um, and then notes that the um, officer goes on to say, in what he characterises as an unfortunate turn of phrase, that when she said the guidance regarding such interviews did not need to be followed. Um, then he goes on to say that he was disappointed in the evidence, which he found to be de defensive and combative, and um, went on to make observations about her <coughs> using terms like disclosure. Um, Paragraph 158, he says, I share the concerns about the quality of the interviewing and the lack of compliance with guidance, which is available to all police officers who are engaged in carrying out uh, such interviews. Now, pausing there, he doesn't identify there what he says the defects are in the process. And he doesn't identify the way in which the um, constable departed from the guidance. And in my submission, that is... Um, fatal to his reasoning. And it's fatal to his reasoning because one has to look at what His Honour Judge Greensmith identifies as defects and the way in which His Honour Judge Greensmith um, relies on those defects <coughs> to reach his conclusion that the um, credibility analysis undertaken by the Deputy District Judge was so flawed that it had to be set aside. Um, and it, it's hugely problematic that the judge deals with this at the end of his consideration of credibility. Um, it's hugely problematic that he does so without linking it back to other issues in relation to her credibility, because he has already reached the conclusion that this young person is truthful, not having taken into account that the exercise of looking at her understanding of truth and lies was so flawed in the way that it was undertaken by the um, officer interviewing her. And so if one um, looks at the question which was raised by uh, Lord Justice McFarlane in the Reed decision which uh, Lord Justice Baker uh, highlighted uh, this morning at paragraph 37, the question for the um, Deputy District Judge was whether the court could be satisfied that the exercise which was undertaken by the um, judge at first instance, uh, and whether the judge himself, Deputy District Judge, could uh, undertake a thorough analysis of the process in order to determine whether the evidence can be relied upon. But that is what we do not see in these two paragraphs where he deals with the AB. At the, at the end of paragraph 156, the DDJ says that the officer should have uh, that should have led her to have a proper investigation as to truth and lies and to avoid using terms such as disclosure so, so why in substance has he not identified the departures from the guidelines well my lord those aren't the only departures from the guidelines but there, that also is not what, um, in my submission, that is not what Lord Justice McFarlane meant when he said a thorough analysis of the process. Uh, and, and that's the phrase that Lord Justice McFarlane used. No, you may be right about that, but, I, but I, 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 I'm just dealing with the submission you made, I think, a moment yes. ago, that the judge had not identified the defects from the guidance. He I, I accept my Lord's point that he identifies those defects, but those are not the only defects. Uh -huh. And it may be helpful if one looks at the way His Honour Judge Greensmith deals with it, but also, if I might signpost a number of um, problems in relation to the um, AB interview. Um, and 
my lords and my lady have looked at this already with um, Mr. Goodwin. But in terms of the AB interview itself, when one looks at the uh, excerpt, first of all, which appears in the judgment of His Honour Judge Greensmith, and it might be helpful to, to do that at this stage, um, His Honour Judge Greensmith looks at the beginning of the AB interview, in which the um, officer speaks with the child about the purpose <coughs> of the interview. So if one turns to the judgment of His Honour Judge Greensmith, and I'll go, if I may, between this and the actual AB interview itself, the electronic uh, reference for it is uh, page 61, and I think the paper bundle is page 58. Thank you. Uh, Mr Goodwin tells me it's 59. Now, this is what um, exercised his honour, Judge Greensmith. Um, this is the truth and lies exercise. Where he says, uh, telling the truth and telling a lie, do you know what the difference is? And the child replies, I'm not sure. And then, without investigating that, the officer goes on to say, OK, well, what do you think would happen if you told a lie? And so on, down the page, saying, it won't go back to us. And then there's a conversation about the consequences of uh, telling a lie. None of those matters are matters that feature in the guidance. Um, in fact, it would be, um, in my submission, quite confusing uh, to link the issue of truth and lies to the issue of consequences. But then one goes on to look at the answers that the young person gives to those questions. Um, we will get into trouble, and then it'll be back to you, and then um, a, a further discussion about that. Now, it may be helpful to look at how those um, questions are developed in the AB interview itself, if one looks at the supplemental bundle. I'm sorry for jumping around. So if you look at the supplemental bundle, and the AB interview begins, I think, at F5. And these are the same um, passages that you looked at this morning, that the court looked at this morning, forgive me, F1, that the court looked at this morning with Mr. Goodwin. And this is not something that the deputy district judge identified as a defect, but in my submission it is a defect. That the, that the officer begins the discussion by saying that you've come to talk to me about something that you made a disclosure about. Now, pausing there for a moment, if I may, there are two problems with that. First of all, there has already been a discussion between this child and this officer, which took place at her home with the social worker. And so when one looks at defects in the ABE process, bringing a child to an interview with the sole purpose of confirming an account they've already given is in itself a difficulty. And the officer met with the child at her home with the social worker in the case, Miss D. Secondly, characterising the discussion and the allegations that the child has made as a disclosure is a red flag, as we all know, in AB interview processes, but also in any discussions with children in which they make serious allegations of sexual abuse. To characterise those as disclosures in itself is problematic. And then it goes on uh, as the um, judge, his honour Judge Greensmith, looked at the question of truth and lies. And in my submission, um, it may be helpful for this court to look at what is there at pages F2 and F3, because that whole discussion about truth and lies is very concerning particularly in the context of the deputy district judge, reaching a view, as he says he does in his judgment, that this was a child who knew the difference between truth and lie. <coughs> we have um, no evidence beyond um, that discussion as to what the child understood as to truth and lies. Um, and the deputy district judge appears to reach that view based on a, a general expectation of a child of that age without taking into account particular circumstances in relation to that child. Now the reason of course why I make those points uh, and why I uh, perhaps you might say labour those points is because they 
feature very prominently in the um, appeal judgment of His Honour Judge Greenswick. Mm. Ms. Fulton, um, yes. if we just look at, and we must be careful about over-interpreting. Yes, yes, of course. So, several people in this room have read many examples of the truth and life lies exercise. <clears throat> um, this is, I've never seen one like this. I'm not sure whether you have this photo, but it's unusual. I haven't. But if the question is, does the child understand, does the, the interviewee understand the difference between truth and lies? Is it your submission that this tells us nothing about that? Well, I think the difficulty, my lord, is uh, twofold. First of all, it is um, an extremely confused exchange. And if it's a confused exchange between the child and the interviewer, it raises a very significant question mark as to whether a judge who is being asked to make a finding that a child was repeatedly, over weeks, months, and years, the um, victim of serious sexual abuse, it, it raises a serious question mark about that child's understanding of truth and lies. And, and that, of course, is not in, in isolation. It's against the backdrop of the child having um, serious issues about their credibility and having told lies in other contexts. And when you have a judge who places very significant reliance on the account given by the child, which follows that conversation, in my submission, it, it is dangerous for a court to rely on that as evidence of an understanding of truth and lies. And, and I think the difficulty, the, the second difficulty, is that it's not clear that that's what the district judge does, because he simply states in his, the deputy district judge, he simply states in his judgment that I am satisfied that the child understands the, the consequences of lies. And, and of course, that's not the issue. It's not whether she understands the consequences, although in my submission you can't say from that that she does. The issue is whether or not she understands truth and lies and the difference between those things. Mm. Uh, and if she doesn't understand truth and lies and the difference between those things, then it, it goes back to my earlier submission to my lords this morning, that the view that her, His Honour Judge Greensmith takes is it's like a domino effect through the uh, substance of the evidence that she has given. On one view, and I, of course one must be careful, about, as I said, about over-interpreting things, but on one view, the child seems to me possibly does explain what she understands by the difference in the context of what she's doing there. She says... Not, it's, it's comes out in an odd way, but she seems to say that if she told a lie, someone would get into trouble, but then it would come back to her. That's what she says. Well, that, that's. What I mean, it's not. I mean, that, it, it's that. it's not a perfect. It's far from perfect, of course, because she, there's a leading question in there as well. Well, that, that's what the officer says. With, with respect, it is it the is. officer who introduces the suggestion that someone would get into trouble. Um, and, and that's... Uh, and my Lord, of course, is right. One, one um, recognises, we recognise, that there will be um, aspects of AB procedures which will depart to some extent from, from the guidance, and there are better examples and worse examples. But, but if my Lord um, is reaching the conclusion that the child seems to understand the consequences of being that somebody would get into trouble. She, she says that in response to a direct question from the officer. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, bear in mind that the consequences of these lies may in fact um, not be recognised or understood by this young person, that a consequence of the allegations that she makes against her stepmother and her father could be uh, her stepmother and her father going to prison. That, that, that's the scale of the seriousness of the allegations that she is making. Uh, and so there, there are two elements to it. It's the truth and lies element, it's the consequences element, uh, and the judge seems to, as it were, focus on the latter. Um, but my lord, there, there are also other difficulties. Um, one, one, and, and I understand my lord's point, Lord Justice Baker, that one uh, ought not to be engaging in a cherry-picking exercise. I understand that. But the other difficulties, the red flags, as it were, that, that um, 
we would signpost the court to, and, and we say feature in um, His Honour Judge Greensmith's uh, judgment, it is, for example, at the top of page F3, when the officer says to um, the child, in the context of a discussion about truth of lies, so to tell the truth is a good thing, it's positive. And again, that, that's a problematic intervention from the officer. And later in the uh, interview, the officer also says to the uh, child at the top of F6, um, as long as you know your teacher did the right thing in contacting the police, and also contact the social services, because it's important we know about these things and then we can help you. Uh, and these, my Lord, Lord Justice Baker, you may know from other judgments in, in which my Lord has made observations, that it, it is the way in which those interventions infect the substantive evidence that is given by the child. And, of course, I accept that my starting point in my submissions to the court this morning was the role of the appellate tribunal. But, but if the judge, at first instance, does not engage with a proper analysis of those issues, then the question for the appellate tribunal is whether that judge has undertaken the exercise that Lord Justice McFarland signposted, in undertaking a thorough analysis of the process in order to determine whether the evidence can be relied upon. Um, so, my lords, we, we say, and my lady, we say that these um, important features of the AB interview do not feature in the analysis of um, Deputy District Judge Hornby. And one then, if I can return to the judgment of His Honour Judge Greensmith, there are a number of points that, that I would make in conclusion about these um, particular issues. Um, it's right, and I said it at the outset, that the judgment of Judge Hornby is a precise and a focused judgment. And it is um, focused primarily on what he uh, identifies as these defects in the ABE process. And uh, I won't take the court through the beginning part of the judgment, because it's very clear when one looks at the skeleton arguments that were before him, that he was aware of and had clear legal argument about the role of the appellate court the demarcation of the um, exercise between the appellate judge and the first instance tribunal. But where he um, does, in my submission, engage with the judgment of the deputy district judge is at page 57 of the core bundle. I'm afraid his judgment isn't paragraph numbered, so I'll, I'll take you through those, the relevant um, paragraphs. Um, page 57 of the core bundle bottom of the page, this court's analysis and assessment of the reliability of the findings made by the deputy district judge. And he starts that analysis by making uh, what, in my submission, is a very forceful point, which does not appear anywhere in the analysis of the deputy district judge. And it is this, that if this child's evidence um, was to be accepted, and if she was found to be credible, the consequence of that was that uh, over a period of days, weeks, months and years, and what he um, uh, summarises as several hundred occasions, a child was taken into a car outside of her home and uh, subject to uh, the treatment and the um, maltreatment of which she complained in, in her interviews. Um, Mr Spencer, I think, will, will make submissions as to the investigations made by his honour judge Greensmith. But it was already in evidence before the court, um, through the evidence, uh, as I understand it, of the social worker, Miss D, and the evidence of the detective constable, Miss R, as to the size of the street and the proximity of houses close to each other and the layout of um, the street involved. And a, a judge um, undertaking or sitting in an appellate capacity is, in my submission, entitled to begin their analysis by asking the question, of the probability or improbability of the allegations that the child made being true. And, and that is entirely absent from the uh, deputy district judge's analysis. And he then follows on from that, his honour judge Greensmith, follows on from that to look at the AB interview itself. And um, I've already taken the court to um, the extract from the AB interview. But, but at page 57 and 58, again in a succinct account, His Honour Judge Greensmith identifies a range of difficulties and defects 
in the reasoning of the deputy district judge, which in our submission were fatal, uh, and he was uh, entitled uh, to reach that conclusion. Do you say he complies with Lord Justice McFarlane's requirements in, in, in that respect? In relation to the analysis of the procedure? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I it's do sufficient think. to recall that it's pe that paragraph with, without the sentence without reciting every departure. Well, my lord, there's a, a relatively um, crude but simple analysis that can be undertaken, which is uh, if one looks at how the deputy district judge deals with the ABE and the relevance of the ABE and the defects in the ABE, um, his honour Judge Greensmith undertakes a much more rigorous analysis of that process. And concludes that he can't rely on it at all. Well, my lord, the, the um, submissions that we've made about the defects in the ABE process would be on all fours with the conclusion of the um, of his honour Judge Greensmith, and and so it won't surprise you that I'm submitting to the court that he was entitled to reach that conclusion. But if my lord undertakes, or if if a judge undertakes the exercise that. Um, Lord Justice McFarland sets out in the re-exercise and <coughs> a court reaches the conclusion that the procedure is so flawed that it infects the substance, which is the conclusion, uh, as I understand it, that is on Judge Greensmith leaves, then he's right uh, to say that he couldn't rely on it uh, at all. And, and my Lord, as I read the judgment of his honour Judge Greensmith, that, that comes from two... Um, uh, threads, as it were, or two two sources. One is his own view that the evidence was uh, so improbable um, that that it, it couldn't have occurred, as the young person said. And the judge didn't engage with that at all. The judge, at first instance, and then there are the um, inconsistencies and the criticisms that he um, identifies. But he's also, um, in my submission, fairly improperly critical of the um, uh, analytical exercise which the Deputy District Judge was required to undertake, and he didn't. Um, my Lord, uh, we have set out in our <coughs> document the criticisms that we make in relation to the Lucas direction, and uh, I hope it will be obvious from what I've said that those submissions that I've made a moment ago all go to rounds one and two of the appellant's uh, case. And in relation to the, the Lucas direction, um, we make a number of points in our skeleton argument, which I won't labour in oral submissions, but I would simply say uh, the following. Um, first of all, the judge doesn't link um, his observations in relation to Lucas generally to the conclusions that he reaches in relation to credibility. And, and there is um, a range of issues on, on which he finds, um, in particular, the father to, to lack credibility. But if any of those issues are um, relevant to the findings which he makes, it, it, it is the view of his honour Judge Greensmith that that is not obvious in the judgment. And in my submission, there is what I think is referred to as a formulaic recitation of Lucas, but no real engagement with Lucas. And of course, that um, would be deficient. This court has, in other contexts, made it clear that um, a recitation of an awareness of Lucas isn't enough to engage in the exercise. And so we say, in that respect, um, his honour Judge Greensmith was right and entitled to reach the view that he um, did. Um, may I just very briefly make uh, some very short submissions about the orders that uh, his honour Judge Greensmith made? Um, we say in our um, skeleton that for a variety of reasons it was open to the um, his honour Judge Greensmith to make interim care orders, but, but we accept that there are difficulties with the way that he did that, and we accept that the, um, those discussions between counsel and his honour George Greensmith were not um, particularly detailed or uh, particularly clear as to his reasoning. But it is open to this court, in my submission, to uphold the judgment and the decision of his honour George Greensmith and to set aside the orders that he makes in relation to the interim care orders. Um, this court, in my submission, is in um, the position of having uh, two judgments, uh, one of which in our submission is so highly consequential as to the findings it makes, um, but so defective as to its reasoning that it would be wrong um, for this court to set aside the judgment of his honour Judge Greensmith and leave that judgment of Deputy District Judge Hornby as the last 
word in relation to the allegations made by this child. But it may well be that this court takes the view that um, the orders made by the uh, circuit judge are, are unsound and somewhat rushed, and, and there's a lack of clarity as to why he made the orders that he did, and I don't seek to persuade you uh, or to press the points beyond what we say in our document about those. Can I ask um, you about one course. other one other permutation, and I, and, I, and I stress that I have no concluded or indeed any view about what the outcome of this appeal will be, yes. because we haven't heard all the submissions and we've got to think about what we hear. But but just thinking ahead to what may be various permutations, yes. uh, would one permutation be that we accept your argument that the circuit judge's judgment was broadly speaking one he was entitled to read? in relation to the procedural defects, but don't accept your argument that there was only one conclusion of fact which was reasonably open to the district judge. Uh, what would happen then? W w would we then be in a situation where we should remit? Well, that, that, um, that is a scenario that we have considered amongst uh, ourselves and our team that there is a um, possibility that the court might reach the view as to His Honour Judge Greensmith's entitlement to query and interrogate the procedural issues. But uh, I accept the, that one outcome might be that um, he has overreached in terms of his conclusion, if I can put it that way. Uh, and if that is the conclusion that this court would reach, then it would have to be remitted. Remitted to which level and, and well, to whom? We, we would say that this is a case that, um, on reflection, possibly should be a case for a circuit judge. Um, but perhaps that is a decision to be made uh, by the FDLJ, uh, who I think is the just Mr. Justice McDonald. Justice Forgive me. Um, what, what, what would be an entirely unsatisfactory state of affairs if one has a judgment from the deputy district judge, which is... Um, of difficulties and, and fraught with, with difficulty in terms of the conclusions that he reaches, and perhaps an appeal judgment that the, this court is not satisfied with sufficiently detailed or um, thorough in, in its conclusions. Um, but, but the consequences for uh, the children in this case, and the consequences for my client and, and her children, um, are obviously life changing. So it, it may require a rehearing of all of the evidence of the case. Very helpful, thank you. And would it be right in those circumstances that the proceedings could not include FT? I do think they would include FT as a subject child. That's what I mean. Of course, yes. FT's allegations, FT because would be an intervener, I think. It would be setting case. aside all orders. So, it would, well, let's just think this through. If, the, if we remit, then the interim care orders made prior to the fact-finding before the Deputy District Judge revive. Yes. And what happens about the order with F regard to FT? I'll have to look this up. It's for sure. Well, I, I do. I, I, I need to give that a little bit of thought. <laughs> my, my immediate reaction is, of course, that FT couldn't be the subject of an, a fresh order once FT has passed. Seven, <coughs> uh, she's 17, I think. Once FT That's right. has passed. But uh, I would like to think, if I may, and it may be something that I have to come back to my Lord, as to whether or not uh, interim care orders can be restored. Because a 17-year-old can be the subject of, I, I think, repeated interim care orders. Um, but, but you, can't make a new, you can't make a new order. Exactly. You can't start proceedings order in relation to... You can't start proceedings, yes. but an order that's made before the age of 17 can continue. Yes. But, but also, um, even if we're wrong about that, and, and I, uh, I'd like to come back to you on that if I may, but even if we're wrong about that, um, FT's status as a an accommodated young person would not be altered if, if FT herself consented to remaining in accommodation, but those are matters for those representing FT as to her status, and, and the benefits to her have been a child needing care, and all of that would continue. Um, but it's really her status in the proceedings. Yes, and maybe you're right. It may be that the interim care order in respect of all the children that, that's would revive my, in the eventuality that we send it back. That's my instinctive reaction, but that's not always the best thing to rely on. 
They are turning my back for one move. Forgive me. I'm just going to say, as someone who's not tutored in this area at all, that would be my instinctive view as well. Okay. If I may just turn my back for one moment. Right. Who's right in position? Just you and me. I raise this for others to address the High Court's decision. Um, so that Ms. Pottrell address addresses this if it's helpful. There is a decision by Mrs. Justice Knowles from 2019 called Re Q, which deals with whether or not an interim counsel can remain ongoing after the child is 17. Right. Um, right. It doesn't. She says, she says it doesn't. There is, in fact, as um, Madame Fell will address you on, there's a conflict on this. We may need to address um, my lords and my lady about this in due course, yes. depending on your decision. Well, well I, it occurs to me that, yes, it may have to wait yes. until then. Um, my lords and my lady, I don't have any further submissions. I, I will come back to my lords and my lady, if I may, either at the closing of the hearing or um, after the hearing about the question about uh, Sergeant O'Neill. Yes, yes. Can, can I just flag up on that, that tomorrow is the end of term, so if there were to be any, anything put in right... It would be by the end of submissions today. All right. But if it's not, then you could, you could have until 4pm tomorrow. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Now, <clears throat> yes. My Lord, Lady, yes. I will seek to not Reveal the passages that have already been covered. I seek to only focus on land which, of course, I hope is fertile. In that, it's perhaps best I look to the respondent's notice, because in that document lies the submissions that haven't perhaps had the most fullest attention so far. Yes. Before doing that, perhaps it's helpful, if I may, to, to take a step back and to say where, on behalf of the father, it is seen this case might go in light of the respondent's notice. Because I have to accept that in saying that there are additional or different grounds on which the decision of the deputy judge could be said to be wrong from those given by the circuit judge, I, I am in many respects weakening the position adopted in relation to remittal and continuation of ICO. I, I say that, of course, because the, His Honour Judge Greensmith heard the appeal over three days, heard submissions that went into granular detail, and of course, if my lord and my lady came to the conclusion that the debt the learned deputy district judge was wrong, but for different reasons, that is unlikely to be arrived at in the same way, to have the opportunity to have the same attention given to the evidence, and therefore in those circumstances, remittal for rehearing, I accept, would be the most likely disposal to follow in those circumstances. Uh, what might uh, such a rehearing look like, and how might this court be reassured that such a process could be undertaken in a way that was consistent with the welfare needs of the children, the need to avoid delay, and having regard to the long history of that case, so of this case so far. Uh, one of the matters that uh, my lords, my lady might have in mind is that there are no appeals uh, against certain findings that the learned deputy district judge made. And, and of course, uh, a rehearing would not necessarily need to be entirely de novo, uh, because certain complaints or certain matters my lord my lady may find warrant the conclusion that the deputy district judge was wrong might include, in my submission, would include, for example, 
a failure to follow the Lucas process properly. Now, taking that as but an example, the failure, of course, is to having identified the lie, and even if one accepts that it's identified as being to a material issue, the, the failure, and I'll, I'll address this in a bit more detail if I may when I get to that point, but the failure lies in the judge not linking or explaining how that links to a realization of guilt on the part of the person who told the lie, or alternatively how it links in a corroborative way to whether or not the event took place. A court rehearing, of course, could rehear the matter with that lie having already been established as, a, as a, a fact, an agreed fact within the case, thereby reducing the number of witnesses and the amount of evidence to be heard. I know that that is a course taken by this court recently in a, in a similar case where, having allowed the appeal, remitted the matter, it did so noting that certain findings of fact had not been subject to appeal and directing that a document of agreed facts be presented to the judge that was rehearing, shortening the process. Um, that's the, the, the stand back, really, the concession in respect of the impact of filing a respondent's notice. Insofar as the matters contained within that notice, the, the first matter, if I may, uh, address you on is the role of individual A and individual B. Uh, the, well, in front of the local authority and uh, in oral submissions and in the, the written skeleton, uh, sought to limit that aspect of the learned deputy district judge's judgment to matter of credibility only. Uh, in, in my submission, in our submission, we say a review of the judgment itself indicates that the weight given to it and the relevance put on the absence of individual A and individual B from the proceedings and or any evidence from them at all went beyond simple matters of credibility of the parents but went to the evaluative process of whether or not the event took place and it, it, it was held against the parents in that regard. Um, I would start uh, if I may, by going to paragraph 154 of the Learned Deputy District Judge's judgment, and that's at page 226 of the bundle. Second sentence we would submit that reveals that this goes beyond uh, credibility and it goes to matters of, in the, in the learned deputy district judge's mind, the investigation, uh, the role of the parents in that process, and by extension, the likelihood, probability of the event having occurred. When the learned district judge says, I find it difficult to understand the parents not being able to identify either of these two men. <coughs> and it's these words I've particularly highlighted. So that they could be interviewed by the police. Uh, that is not, in my our submission, a credibility matter. That is a a matter touching upon or coming as close <coughs> to an explicit term, a, a burden uh, of proof. That, that though is, um, my lords, my lady, the, not the only part of the judgment where Deputy District Judge Hornby engages with that uh, or this issue. He does so again <coughs> at Paragraph 169. What? Excuse me. What about um, paragraph 155? Yes. 
Maybe you were referring to that at the same point. Forgive me if you were, but um, I bear in mind. Doesn't 155 follow on from 154? It, it does, my lord. Um, it follows on in the same way the, the next set of paragraphs, 168 and 169, do, which is for the learned de deputy judge to make an observation as to how this matter has struck him or how he is um, troubled by their absence from the case, but reminding himself that they. Uh, do not bear a burden. Yeah. The submission made, though, is despite the reminder, it is entirely absent then what its relevance is. If, if the learned judge has reminded himself it's not for them to prove, and he's noted that he's struck by it, well, what is the consequence? in his mind and ultimately in the evaluative process leading to the judgment of him having been struck by that matter. Well, doesn't he explain that at paragraph 168? I could not accept their evidence on crucial matters. My Lord, yes. So that, that's credibility. And one of the reasons he gives <laughs> for forming that view is that an apparently close friendship came to an end without any reason. It's not the only factor, as Mr. Goodwin Submitted, but it, it's one fact. Other other things are he mentions there. It, it, my lord, he does, uh, and I uh, our submission is not that this did not go to credibility. It clearly, mm. did go to credibility. Yes, uh, but it had a secondary uh, a secondary quality in the mind of the deputy district judge in the process of evaluation that he ultimately held against the parents in determining whether or not the event occurred beyond matters of credibility. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, I take into the first paragraph that my submission also supports that. But was he not entitled to do that? Uh, he, he, I thought your submission is that this indicates that he put the burden of proof on the parents. It, he but let's assume that he didn't do that. Yes. Right? Let's assume that for the sake of the argument. Are you saying that it was still impermissible for him to take into account this as a piece of evidence when forming his overall, over, overall findings of fact? No. All right. All right. He's entitled, uh, and no criticism would be made if the point was reached where it was credibility only, and then the credibility be that what effectively a finding of a lie. I do not believe I, these parents are lying to me when they say they do not know where these individuals are. Mm. Uh, then, of course, one enters into the Lucas process mm. of why are they lying. Uh, but that isn't necessarily there are two parts to that. Firstly, that isn't the entire process that the learned judge mm. adopted. The learned judge stopped that identifying as a credibility matter, and I struggle to accept their evidence on that point. Yes, I don't want to distract you at all. If you're coming back to Lucas, I'll, I'll save my question for that. For that I stage. am, my Lord. You are. Shall, shall I save my question then? I have a question about Lucas in a moment. Well, my lord, if it's on my lord's mind. <laughs> well, it's only this that, that uh, Lucas, and I, I, I've had to give a Lucas direction lots of times to juries in the Crown Court. Uh, Lucas concerns a situation where there's an out of court lie. Yeah. Right? But it, it, I mean, witnesses lie all the time in court. Um, and and uh, the way in which a judge evaluates their evidence in court proceedings is often to say, well, I, I, I take into account what they say, but it's contradicted by the documents, the contemporary documents, it's contradicted by other inconsistent statements, and so on and so forth. So do you, do you have to give, as a trial judge, do you have to give yourself the Lucas direction every time you find that a, a witness has been not be telling the truth in the witness box? Well, my lord, I, I don't wish to seem to not answer your question, and I will. Uh, but of course, this lie in this instance wasn't the lie given in oath or under oath in evidence. It was first given to well, the HIV. No, I understand that. Before. I understand that. Um, and in distinction between perhaps the criminal process where the direction is for the benefit of the jury yes. uh, with the, the lack of familiarity of the concept. Yes. Uh, of course, in these proceedings, it is to assist the decision maker, mm. or to assist in reminding the decision maker and therefore those that mm. read the decision, that that is a matter that has been borne in mind. 
Yeah. I may have misunderstood what the judge is saying, but in paragraph 168, lines 2 and 3, he refers to their evidence. I struggle with the evidence that the identity and whereabouts of A and B were unknown to the parents. <coughs> uh, I may have misunderstood him, but I, I thought he was there <coughs> reciting the evidence they had given before him. My Lord, I would say that that would be um, inconsistent right. with the summaries of the evidence the deputy district judge gives within the judgment earlier. I see. Where the learned deputy district judge describes on this issue uh, their evidence as having been that they know these individuals. Mm. There's a dispute as to how well, but they last saw them in or around 2017 and do not know their current whereabouts, but were able to identify where they were when they last knew them. All right. And, and that does touch upon a matter I will turn to. So if I just have that as a, yes. a balloon, so to speak, yes. today. Yes. That is part of the submission that goes to, it cannot be characterized as they have refused or um, they have uh, kept those individuals out of process. <coughs> they have assisted to the extent that they say they're able to. Yes. Where though um, they, or we would argue that the learned judge, and that's the deputy district judge, uh, fell into <coughs> to error was not thereafter placing into the balance the impact of the absence of evidence or participation of those two individuals. It, it is, in my submission or our submission, insufficient to simply look to the police investigation and say, well, that ended prematurely, and therefore that's it. We are where we are. So to if that were the case, of course, there are many cases that come before the family court where there has, for whatever reason, been no police investigation. Yet then, in those circumstances, it is necessary for a local authority, and ultimately the court, to look to adopt or take steps which facilitate the obtaining of the necessary evidence to make the decisions that ultimately are grounded in promotion of the children's welfare as the paramount consideration. Uh, this that though does touch upon what would be or will be number number two, which is the deficiencies or the impact of the deficiencies in the local authority and the police investigation. If I may, I'll return to <coughs> and just conclude by maybe which is point one, the, the role of individual A and B. Yes. That those two do align um, at this juncture. I, I've cited um, within the document placed before the court um, the authority of Lancashire County Council A, B and Z. Yes. I, I placed it before the court with, with fulsome apologies that it was only this morning. To draw uh, my lady and my lord's attention to paragraphs 40 and 41, not to... start by reassuring that I understand the limits of the authority in that this authority was directed at the duties of a local authority in respect of production of material already held within its possession mm. or otherwise obtained from third parties. Uh, but in terms of paragraphs 40 and 41, the, the, our submission is that one can draw from this though a duty or responsibility to the court of the local authority in cases such as this where simple steps 
are open to be taken, which would best advance the court's fact-finding role. And a failure to do so is a matter that must be placed into the balancing exercise by the court when deciding whether a matter has been proven or not. That is to say that there is evidence available which has not been produced by the applicant or the party that bears the burden. <coughs> In other cases, it, a poor analogy, it's the alibi. Well, I, I was, we were seen somewhere else, we were with our grandmother, but we produced no evidence from the grandmother. <coughs> Very crude, I accept, my lord, my lady. But pretend to paragraph 40, the, the duty. Uh, the applicant in public law proceedings, the local authority, must prove its case. And in so doing, must be alive to the strengths and weaknesses of all the evidence before the court. Uh, I regard the statement as supportive of the dicta of Lord Justice Ryder in paragraph 36 of the UW, uh, namely the proceedings under the Children Act 1989 <coughs> are quasi inquisitorial in that the judge has to decide both where the threshold is crossed and the basis upon which that it is, so that whether or not the local authority or any party agrees, it seems to me obvious a local authority with the greater resources available to it will bear the lion's share of the burden of assisting the court to determine not only the application, but also any other pertinent issues in the case. It does so by ensuring the evidence from whatever source is complete and in order, carries on, uh, for a local authority to act in that impartial manner in public law proceedings is to facilitate the court's quasi-inquisitorial role in the process, which is not, which is fair to all the parties. Uh, and at 41, the parallels with the duties on mm. the Crown Prosecutor in criminal cases, the reasonable lines of inquiry have been followed, those sorts of matters. Is that particular analogy with the Crown prosecutor from being the subject of judicial comment previously, uh, particularly as an appellate level? My inquiries, my inquiries couldn't find, I say of course, my inquiries couldn't support the submission beyond this. Yes, I see. Um, and hence me, in the document I placed before the court, taking matters back to the core Children Act principle. Yes. Which is, of course, in section 47, at the point where <coughs> they become aware of, the local authority becomes aware of a child potentially in need, it has a duty to investigate. Yes. And that investigatory duty involves an explicit in the guidance says, speaking to relevant yeah. individuals, etc. So, uh, well, we'll have to think about it. It, it, it. Speaking for myself, it doesn't strike me as obviously. An, uh, No. Um, and, and even in the criminal context, I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of learning, partly in the form of Attorney General's guidelines and partly in the form of case law, both here and in Strasbourg. So there's, there's a lot of learning on what exactly are the duties of the Crown in a criminal context. And of course, it is a very different context, not least because the burden of this, the standard of proof is very different. Um, the consequences are punishment, for example. Um, but even in that context, my understanding is that there isn't a duty to investigate things that haven't been investigated. What there is, is a duty to disclose material which is unused uh, because it may point away from guilt as well as towards guilt. My Lord, I wouldn't speak to the criminal process, mm -hmm. um, but to the family process, and it's this process that was undertaken. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't that certain evidence um, is sitting there in an unused folder, I accept. Mm -hmm. it, it is that there were sim simple steps mm -hmm. open to be taken, mm -hmm. which would have supported or undermined mm -hmm. the allegation being pursued by the local authority. Yes. The question is, if those steps are not taken, against whom, if anyone, against whom uh, should that count detrimentally 
when assessing whether or not an event is likely to happen. And in my submission, it must be on the applicant. Because in this case, for example, the telephone of the child, it was not a case where it was always in the possession of the police. Of course, the police declined to interrogate it. Mm. But it was then released to the parents and produced to the local authority on their request. Mm. So they held the evidence. It was therefore the closest one can come to to the unused material schedule. That was a, a step. And they chose in the proceedings, not to interrogate it, not to examine it, in order to produce evidence that either supported their contention or undermined it. Other simple steps, and I say simple uh, as in resource light and simple in the sense of forensically obvious in my submission, Eden me, E, featured within the narrative uh, and featured in the case in ways in which placed her in a position on the child's case to speak to the veracity or otherwise of the child's account. An individual known a child known to the local authority that could have been spoken to but wasn't. And, and even closer, the sister, a looked after child in their care, accommodated by them, who is on the child's account, present in the bedroom for the three years in which on a near nightly basis it is said by the child she was being removed from the bedroom and in ways in which taking the description in the AB interview at times was noisy. Take for example the first, the alleged first incident where it is said by the child that the mother knocked on the door and that is what caused her to wake her up. That child, sibling, not spoken to in a way which would have or could have assisted the court in the process of determining the truth or otherwise of the allegation. And even where uh, uh, sorry, those are some examples. Yes. Those were, and if, if my lord, my lord, my lady, don't accept or see limited weight to the, to the submission or context I put that forward in, but, but the subsidiary point is well, those matters were not engaged with by the learned deputy district judge in the case in the way that would reveal or to the satisfaction uh, explain the ultimate decision arrived at. Mr Spencer, could I just ask you, were these omissions that you've identified, gaps in the evidence, drawn to the deputy district judge's attention? Yes. My Lord, for example, um, in the submissions made by the children's guardian at a70, which is supplemental bundle. Paragraph 42, but of course there's discussion both preceding and supplemental. Uh, 
paragraph 42? My lord, yes. Or oh, that's the conclusion. It is. And, um, and of course, these are the submissions made mm. by and on behalf of the three non-complainant subject children. Yes. But the submissions made along these lines on behalf of your client? On behalf of... There was... My Lord, I have to refresh my memory on the submissions that are in the bundle which were filed. There certainly was criticism of the investigation made mm. in fact, by all parties uh, and it's fair to say that there was an invitation across the board save and accept uh, the position was reserved in res respect of uh, a complainant child that there should be or the court should consider making criticism of the police in respect of its investigation Can I just be clear, forgive me, Mr. Spencer, what your what this point really goes to. Judge has to make his decision on the evidence put before him. It, what is your central submission about about the absence of this evidence? Yeah, um, the court must have. Oh, of course, the court will make a decision based on the evidence before it. But it must also have regard to the failure to produce evidence that might be available in support of an allegation. And the failure to do so is a matter that counts to the detriment of an applicant. And I gave the, the very crude, my Lord, my Lord Justice Baker, I gave the very crude comparison, mm -hmm. and I accept it's entirely crude, but it's the alibi defense, the, the, the evidence before the court is given by a person, I was elsewhere. The court will look to the person to say, well, have you produced evidence that would support that? And in this case, there is evidence that might have supported or undermined and in their possession, critical evidence, the, the mobile phone, which wasn't. My Lord, might I then end this point by showing how then that reveals itself in the decision and the judgment of the learned deputy district judge um, in, in a clear tension in the finding. And that can uh, be seen uh, at page 245, which is in the response to question clarification question. My lady, my lord, no doubt, um, no reminders <coughs> needed, but this is in the context, ultimately, the deputy district judge found in relation to the, the messaging group that its participants were the two men stepmother and the child and one sees he declined to find that he was a member of that group despite of course that having been the child's evidence in ABE. Uh, his explanation, the learned judge's explanation is that they're set out at 245 under 1D in bold as the phone phones were not interrogated I have limited findings to what could be viewed as having some support. This assertion I do not find made out. So how is it the father asks, uh, and I make the submission, that the learned judge found that the absence of mobile phone interrogation prevented him from concluding that he was a member of the group, but didn't hinder 
the conclusion as to the participation of the two men, individual A and individual B, in the group, particularly in the context that the oral evidence from the police officer who did view the phone was that she saw E, the child, and the mother in the group, but not the two men. Moving on, may I, um, my lady, my lords, to just cover um, the failure to engage in a way that the appellate court and the parents are able to understand with the inherent probabilities of key masses of evidence. These are all masses on which submissions were made to the learned deputy district judge. But do not find themselves explained or considered within the judgment in circumstances where they are so integral to the overall likelihood or the evaluation of likelihood. They required to be. And I've, these are set out, we set these out at paragraph 18, A to F, in our document. And you just give us an argument. Indeed, yes. The, to assist, though, to taking those in turn at 18A, <coughs> submissions can be seen were made to the deputy district judge at A98 in relation to B. Those were made at A86. In respect of C, which is the physical likelihood that, that her mother had given birth some 14 days earlier would be physically able, capable, like being in the back of a two-seater car, engaging in sexual intercourse in the way that the child described. Submissions were made at A98. In respect of leaving newborn baby in turn over, two, over three years twice, newborn babies and therefore young babies thereafter, uh, in a house without them waking, A87. And then in relation to the sibling at A87. Those combined with the noticeable in our submission, lack of engagement with what is particularly striking in our submission about this case is how the abuse uh, its described nature, a single kiss lasting seconds on the lip, on each occasion nothing more, nothing less, until year three when there was a single occasion uh, of the touching of the breast, but for two and a half years it was kiss on the lips in the car with no description by the child as to the surrounding circumstances. What was done beyond that, or even beyond the first event, how she responded, felt, reacted. Matters that demanded in our submission engagement by the learned deputy district judge. And finally, um, on the respondents' notice matters, I, I draw my lady and my lord's attention to what appears in the reading of the judgment to have been critical uh, or played certainly a large part in the deputy district judge's thinking uh, and that is the absence of motivation he asserts in the judgment for the allegations being made by the child. Uh, our submission is that it is a matter of some significance in his, in the learned judge's evaluation. He <coughs> says so, at paragraph 130, um, where he says, I accept, of course, it's not for them to prove that the allegations are false, but seems to be a significant feature in this case. 
for the child. Um, and at paragraph 167, noting that no reason has been put forward as to why the child would make these allegations. That is a finding that is inconsistent in our submission with the judge's own recitation of the evidence earlier in the judgment. And I say that because the learned judge noted that explanation was given by the father, or potential explanation was proffered, that it may have been motivated in order to secure the return of the child's mother from abroad. Uh, in fact, a motivation that was in the evidence, receiving the evidence in the AB interview as given by the child herself, when she said, my stepmother, uh, why, my stepmother thinks I'm lying because I want, she says, I want my mother to come back. Of course, an explanation the stepmother's never given. And the submission we make in our documents is perhaps that revealed, or the judge should have engaged with whether or not that revealed, in fact, the truth of the matter as expressed by a 15-year-old child who's projecting that onto someone else. My Lords, my lady, the, the last in terms of submissions now moving on from the notice are twofold. Uh, to be taken very briefly, the lies told the Lucas. Um, and it's the HIV lie. Baker uh, characterized it as something that appears uh, to have played large in the mind of the deputy district judge. But of course, and this perhaps reveals in my submission, our submission, the flaw, it's a lie told by the non-perpetrator on the allegation. Uh, it's told by a person that on the findings made <coughs> did not believe the truth of the allegation. There's no finding he was aware of the, the, tr the, the, the event. The, the finding was that he was aware that the child had complained, but he didn't believe it. So the lie told by a person that doesn't believe it to be true, we submit, can't support the truth or otherwise of the event having happened. It reveals the state of mind of the person who told the lie. He's, in this instance, either bolstering his belief, he's seeking to protect the integrity of his wife, who he believes is wrongly accused. Whatever the explanation, or whatever the conclusion the learned deputy district judge might reach on it, what it doesn't do in my submission is then take the next stage. But he's not aware of whether it happened or not. In fact, he believes it hasn't. And he's lying about <coughs> it to support his belief rather than whether or not the event happened. And that's, if the Lucas process had been followed, or the process from the judgment been seen to have been followed, um, that would have revealed itself to not have the significance, should not have had the significance um, that was ultimately given to it. I was my learned friend from the mother um, foreshadowed that the concluding point would be in respect of the stepping into the arena yes. of, of the Google images, and this ties to the application first thing this morning. And, and the point I make, or we make in the skeleton argument is um, it was a shortcut to see evidence that was already in the bundle. Or not in the bundle, available to the court. But it was available to the court um, is um, undoubted because it's addressed in the closing submissions again of the uh, children's guardian um, who observes that the court has the body-worn camera footage as well as a transcript. Um, in that regard, uh, the learned circuit judge, His Honour Judge Greensmith, um, was simply adopting a short version or a short approach to view that which was already before the court. And as stated in the skeleton argument, it is integral to understand the decision 
at both instances to understand the locale in which it is said to have occurred. My lady, my lord, those are the submissions. Are there any matters I can assist with further? No, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Goodwin. My lord, very briefly in reply, if I may, um, a point that your lordship raised, in fact, quite a long time ago in relation to the park, and I gave your lordship a reference within the police log to help identify which officers were present and which not present. That reference was at F83, but I have since had confirmed by my junior, who of course was trial counsel, that DC Rogers confirmed in oral evidence that the participants in the strategy meeting, the police participants in the strategy meeting, were not present at the school, and that no one has ever suggested that that evidence was wrong. The police witnesses said that? The police say? witness, DC Rogers, said that. The second point is arising from the father's submission. I take this from the father's skeleton, paragraph 32, which is at page 136 of the core bundle. Paragraph 32, page 136. It was not, it was not for the parents to provide an explanation for why FD had made false allegations. However, potential explanation was in the evidence before the court the deputy district judge was wrong not to consider that possible explanation. The, po the potential explanation was given by the child herself in ABE interview, wherein she asserts that her stepmother thinks that she is making a false allegation so dad won't divorce and bring her mother over. The stepmother has never advanced that explanation, which gives rise to the possibility that it is in fact not the stepmother's thoughts on the issue, but rather a revelation into the true circumstances of the situation by the child projected onto the stepmother. Now at F132 and F144, I need to turn to those myself, those are the extracts from the stepmother's own interview. F132. One sees reference being made by the stepmother, or hints at least from the stepmother, to that very topic. At the bottom of the page, first of all, so she said that because she's underage, she could bring her biological mum to the UK, is the question from the officer. But that's preceded by, I don't know why she's made it. However, recently she's mentioned that if you're underage, somebody's told me that I can bring my own biological mum. She was mentioning these things to my recollection. And then if one moves to one four, or F144, <coughs> at the bottom of the page again, <coughs> I have no idea why she's saying this, but as I've told you earlier, I guess she's only a minor. And she's just making this because maybe she will be about to bring her mum. This is what I have to say. Sorry, which page is that? So, my lady, that is at F144, PDF 378, the supplemental bundle, at the bottom of the page. So I draw on those two references. You say the assertion in paragraph 32 is not supported by the evidence. Exactly. My lord and my lady, the only other point I wanted to address the court about was what the consequences might be of the different decisions made by this court following today's hearing. Mm. If the local authorities' appeal succeeds on all fronts, and therefore Judge Hornby's findings are restored, then the case at first instance remains in its interim stages, and this court should therefore allow the Deputy District Judge, the same Deputy District Judge, to continue the process of case management through to a welfare hearing, as would have been the case if uninterrupted by the appellate process. If the local authorities' appeal partially succeeds, insofar as Judge Greensmith's decision is overturned, that there is a remission 
for a rehearing of the local authorities' factual contentions, then I agree with Ms. Fotterell's submission that the case would be appropriate for circuit judge level and the allocation decision made by the FPLJ. As to the underlying orders, we know that the interim care orders for the younger children are still subsisting by reason of Lord Justice Moylan's permission order and the stay order that preceded that. There's no doubt about that. And there's no difficulty with the interim care orders continuing if there's a jurisdictional basis on the facts for them to do so. The position in relation to FT is certainly more complicated. If the decision, I'm not going to address you about the rights and wrongs of this decision now because there's a means by which we can all do this on paper if necessary. But if the decision of Mrs Justice Gwyneth Knowles in Read Q is correct, namely that an interim care order made before a child's 17th birthday cannot extend beyond the child's 17th birthday, then that presents difficulties. The, the counter argument to that, of course, is that if the factual foundation for the full care order in respect of FT falls away, the original interim care orders made at the start of the care proceedings for her are restored and continue beyond her 17th birthday until final determination, which would mean her position would be preserved at least in the interim, i.e. she could still be subject to an interim care order pending a further hearing. I'm sorry, it's my fault. I didn't follow. On what, on what hypothesis does that arise? That arises if there is um, a remission of the local authorities' factual contentions to be determined at a rehearing of the of the care proceedings fact-finding process. If that happens, then uh, the original interim care order made in respect of FT would continue until the factual determination. If Mrs Justice Gwyneth Knowles is correct, that process is, is impermissible. Yes. Because the ICO, if we go back in time to the original point at which the ICO yes. was made, it can't, as a legal point, extend beyond her 17th well, that's birthday. Right. That's and understood to be yeah. the position. But, but you're, you're apparently contradicting that. No, I'm, I'm simply setting out the two legal arguments I, I, at this I, I, stage. Because Mr. Justice, Mr Justice Gwyneth Knowles refers to a counter-decision by yes. Mr Justice Williams. Right. And that's why my learned friend refers to... That's right. There are, there are, there are point. conflicting first instance decisions. Exactly. Which haven't been resolved. If, um, may I? If we just allow, if we, on the first, if we allow the appeal, and the case is rem and the case goes back to the deputy district judge. That's in respect to the younger children. Isn't Absolutely, because the older children, mm. the FT has a case. Oh, it's not a problem then. And that's not a problem. Mm. It only arises on remission at this point. My lord, that is right. Thank you. Mm. It, this is the partial success point. Exactly, my lord. Yeah. Yeah. Can I assist in respect of any other points, procedural or substantive? No. Good. Do you want to say anything in reply to the submissions made by the? And Ms. Fotter in particular brought by Mr. Spencer about the deputy district judge's treatment of probability or improbability. Well, I can't find in the deputy district judge's judgment um, an explicit articulation of so called improbabilities of events taking place, but it would, in my submission, be artificial in the extreme to suppose that the judge was not taking those into account when surveying the wide canvas. We know that he drew on all the material that was available to him. In my submission, this court can with confidence uh, assume and interpret the judgment to mean that he had took into account the probability of the child's core account being truthful. The child's core account did involve her being taken out to that car repeatedly at night. So to argue that the judge therefore somehow ignored the inherent improbabilities of that, in my submission, cannot work as a submission because those inherent improbabilities or probabilities were 
the stuff with which the judge's core decision was made. And I, I also remind the court, of course, that this was happening in the early hours of the morning. It wasn't happening in the middle, it happening in the middle of the afternoon. So insofar as the submission is made, or insofar as Judge Greensmith thought that it was inherently improbable that no one would report to the police, that begs the question of who was around at that time of the night, how much noise was being made, who was sticking their head out of the window to try and understand where the noise was coming from, if there was noise. And there's no suggestion in the child's account that it was noisy. If anyone could see into the car, well, I made the submission about FT herself saying the windows were black. And if someone did see what was going on, somebody saw fit to report it themselves voluntarily, because only one person was spoken to on the house or by, on the house to house inquiries <laughs> by the police. So these various considerations are they're at the core of the process that the judge undertook. They required they required the judge to consider. <clears throat> on the balance of probability whether the allegation was made out. He did just that. He took into account all of the circumstances. So I would try to deter this court from taking what I would describe as a narrower factual interpretation. Of course, on appeal, it's pointed out that uh, the judge at first instance doesn't take into account various particular points or doesn't express that he took those points into account. But no judge is going to articulate every single point of detail that led him or her into their decision. There's plenty of case law on the need not to articulate every single point. The important thing is that the reader understands the basis on which the judgment was made, the rationale behind it, the core reasons for the decision. In my submission, that was done in this case. Yeah, and the appellate courts have often said that the longer a document is, the, the less it tends to facilitate understanding of the analysis. It's much harder to write a short judgment. Yes. Now, if you'd finished on that topic, can I ask you about something else that, course, was, that was mentioned by Mr Spencer, which is the recent decision in Lancashire County Council and A, <laughs> and uh, paragraphs 40 and 41 were drawn to our attention. I just wondered if, you, if there's anything you want to say about that. Um, my Lord, I confess I was given this updated authorities bundle as I walked into court, so I've not yet had an opportunity no, to no, well, that's look fine. at that in detail, that's so I would need some time to respond to that, I'm afraid. No, that's fine. Yeah. Well. Um, what, I, what I would like to do is to, to rise for a few minutes so that we can um, discuss amongst ourselves of course. what the next steps will be. Yes, my lord.
it in the bottom? Yeah. Was it a separate one? Yeah. 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 Before we finish, there's just a couple of things I need to mention. First, if I may, Miss Foxrell, uh, there's, I think at one point when you were on your feet, you thought you might need further time to come back to us about, with a reference or two, but are you going to need any more time or have you finished now? Um, I don't think I'm going to need any more time. Uh, I, I have a number of references. What I had in mind was simply to email them through, <coughs> and just to make clear, Mr. Goodwin's submission that Officer McNeil or O'Neill was not present at an interview is correct. That, that is correct. So the information that was relayed to the strategy meeting was um, from notes, as I understand it. And Mr. Purple, who was trial counsel, gave me a number of references, which I was simply going to email through to the court, or I can, read, I can give them to you orally. Yes, why don't you do that now? I think it's better yes. to finish the hearing now. Indeed. So there's C6, paragraph 10, C17, oh, paragraph, C6, C6, paragraph, paragraph 10. 10. Yeah. C17, paragraph 17, yeah. and I5 to I7. And those are the places in which there is any reference to uh, the incidents as having occurred at the park. Um, although, as my Lord, Lord Justice Baker has said, they're not first-hand evidence taken at the time. It is reported at a later stage. All right. Thank you very much. <coughs> well, just for the... Sorry, Mr. My Lord, I'm very conscious that in response to your Lordship's question just before the court rose, I didn't give a full answer in relation to the question of improbabilities. Mm. And I should say and point out that in the Deputy Judge's judgment, in the section on the law, at paragraph J, this is page 231 of the core bundle, page 231, the Deputy Judge specifically noted the need for him to consider the inherent probability or improbability of the of an event remains a matter to be considered when weighing the probabilities and then there's a citation of Lord Hoffman's in read B within that paragraph this is little j on that page thank you my lord right, thank you very much well we're grateful to not only the advocates but those instructing them for their preparation and presentation of this appeal we will reserve our judgments and they will be circulated in draft form on a confidential basis in the usual way, uh, particularly for the benefit of those who are not familiar with the court's procedures. I must emphasize that that confidential draft is embargoed and the court will take very seriously any breach of that confidential embargo. Indeed, this court has said in a recent judgment that such a breach of an embargo may constitute a contempt of court. Uh, that is an occasion not to re-argue the case or to make further submissions. Uh, it is simply an opportunity to correct typographical errors and other obvious factual errors. Uh, because uh, we haven't reached any view on what the outcome will be, uh, there are, as has been discussed during the hearing, a number of possible outcomes. And so if the court uh, feels that it reaches a stage where it needs any further written submissions, uh, then of course the parties would have the opportunity uh, to file 
and serve those. Unless there's anything else, thank you very much.